Assalamu alaikum everyone. Hello everyone. My name is Musa. I'm the policy coordinator with CARE San Francisco Bay Area. We want to welcome you and thank you for coming to our CARE SFBA and MCC East Bay and SRVIC uh, East Bay Candidate Forum. This event will provide a valuable opportunity to engage with local candidates and understand their positions on issues that matter to our community. This election is a crucial moment where we must make our voices heard, especially with everything that's going on in the world. It's more important than ever that we mobilize as a bloc, especially as Muslims, and make our voices heard and show our elected officials that we care and show our communities that we care. And I just want to start with a quick um, clarification. As 501c3 organizations, CARES FBA and MCC East Bay and SRVIC do not endorse or support any candidate nor their statements. We have extended invitations to all candidates regardless of political affiliation. The forum's intent is to offer candidates a platform to address the community's questions and to assist voters in making informed decisions. Now that we have all of that out of the way, I think I'd like to start with inviting our Dublin candidates to the stage. So we have Councilmember Josie, Rezi Husney, and John Murata. So just please make your way to the front. Yep, you can go through the side. And we have one mic there in the center that you all can share. Okie dokie. Gene, you can be in the middle. <laughs> yeah. Jack, if you'd like, you can come up to the front as well. I think we can combine the Dublin Pleasanton candidates, right? There's one of you, so no worries. <laughs> no, no, no. So we'll, we'll fold together our Dublin and Pleasanton candidates. There we go. Okay, cool. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for bearing with me. So do you want to introduce yourselves real quick to everybody in the audience and everyone watching on the live stream? And oh yeah, let's turn that mic on. Let's do that. Hello, hello. Check, check. All right. I guess you can start to put you on the spot. Right. No problem. Hi, um, my name is Jean Josie. I'm currently on the Dublin City Council and I am um, one of the four mayoral campaigns in Dublin. Um, apparently the only one who came today. So thank you so much for hosting us today. We really appreciate the opportunity to um, get a chance to talk to you all today. Do you, what format do you want us? You can just pass the mic to each other to introduce yourselves and then I'll start with a question essentially. Okay. Yeah, cool, cool. And I guess we can go left to right if we want to do the questions. Okay. Yeah, sorry, I can hand it to you first, but okay. we'll figure it out from there. <laughs> well, uh, happy Sunday, everybody. My name is John Morata. I am a candidate for Dublin City Council District number three. Hello, my name is Jack Balch. I am a candidate for Pleasanton Mayor. Welcome, uh, or appreciate you welcoming me here to your um, amazing facility. So thank you. I feel very honored. Okay. I'll pass the mic all over. Perfect. Let's leave this right here. Cool. Awesome. Thank you so much for the introductions. And my. Oh, we forgot the person. I'm so sorry. I was getting ahead of myself. And my name is Razi Hasni. I'm also a candidate for District 3. Uh, this message is my home, so I'm glad to be home. <laughs> and my apologies. Thank you so much for that. All right, perfect. Now we'll start with some questions. I think we want to keep that on probably. And I think what we can do as a format, we can just go left to right for the questions. Okay. So the topic we're going to start with are hate crimes against Muslims, Arabs, and Palestinians. We witnessed an unprecedented increase in anti-Muslim, anti-Arab, and specifically anti-Palestinian hate crimes, both in frequency and severity. 2023 was the worst year of anti-Muslim hate recorded in CARES 30-year history, worse than after Trump's Muslim ban. For example, women's hijabs have been stripped off their heads and spit on, and kids have been attacked and bullied at school. And despite the seriousness of these incidents, some local leaders have remained silent. So my question is, are you willing to break the silence of the rising level of hate targeting our community? And more importantly, what specific steps will you take to prevent and address the rising levels of anti-Muslim, anti-Arab, anti-Palestinian hate in our communities? You can start. Uh, thank you for the question. I think, uh, you know, the Prophet said, which means that you need to seek knowledge even if it's in China. So the premise of that base for me is that, you know, we have to be... Um, we have to be involved as candidates. So as, as, as leaders in our community, we have to step up. So we put our, our best foot forward as, as, a, as a Muslim candidate and uh, be involved in our community and be involved in the decisions that our community, may, and our, that our community makes. So I, I think the first thing that we can do as, as 
to to protect Muslims against hate crimes is be involved in the community. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm proud to say that Dublin is one of the most tolerant cities and one of the most beautiful cities that I've I've uh, I've lived in. We have people from all faiths, from you know, from the Sikhs to Muslims to Jews to uh, Christians to everybody else. You know, getting along together and 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 uh, you know, living side by side. Uh, but as a candidate, I you know, my my first my my. As a candidate, my first thing is, is being involved in shining a light on on, uh, on uh, putting our best foot forwards as 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 candidates to shine a light on what we can do. Um, I don't stand for any kind of prejudice. I don't stand for any kind of hate. I was uh, I, I was born and you know I'm, I'm um, my mother is American. My dad's from Tunis, and I lived I lived for the first fourteen years of my life overseas. And when I first came to this country, I actually came to I landed in a town called White Settlement, Texas, and it just sounds it sounds exactly like what it is, right? So, and I grew up in Texas. I went to school in Texas and UT, and uh, but I, I, I've seen the level of you know acceptance and, and tolerance and love. And I think the number one thing that we that we can do as candidates is just be involved and shine a light, shine a positive light on on what our community is all about and what the um, can do so being involved is step number one yeah thank you for that thank you for the question i mean um as elected leaders it is our responsibility as well as our privilege to stand up for hate everywhere we see it and um, i have a strong record of that i was down in san francisco protesting the muslim ban um we, i've done it from the dais i've done it in my private life um but as as Razi said it's all hate everywhere um, I also participated in um, anti-Asian hate rallies. I participated in um, anti-black um, uh, hate rallies. Um, I call it out everywhere I see it. Um, it is on us to stand up every time we see prejudice and ugliness. And um, Dublin, it, as you said, has a strong history of um, inclusivity and standing up for our residents and making sure that all of our residents feel safe. In my day job, I know we just did a, a quick introduction. We didn't really tell you anything about ourselves. Um, I work in education. I work in a high school that is very, very diverse and has a lot of um, different voices to be heard and standing up for my students um, when they feel that they are under um, verbal attack um, is very important to me. Um, I have in my office wall, I have quite a number of posters that are um, inclusive that make students that come into my office to talk to me immediately feel at ease to know that I am a safe place. My staff all wear um, lanyards that have a variety of buttons on them that talk about um, inclusivity and uh, making students feel safe and seen for who they are. Um, and I, I strongly feel that those of us who look like me have an obligation to stand up for those who do not um, and to use our privilege to call out racism, um, and prejudice everywhere we see it. And um, we celebrate No Place for Hate in the city of Dublin every year. It's a, it's a campaign. Um, we put up posters and give, give them to businesses. And um, I have that on my office wall as well. And um, I am not shy about calling out hate in all of its forms. And that includes anti-Muslim um, prejudice and hate. And um, we've been fairly lucky in Dublin that it has been verbal and not physical. That that doesn't mean that it can't immediately cross a line and so being able to put ourselves in between the bigots that are causing the issues and people that are being targeted um, is you know it's not just words it's actions and I have done that stepping in front of people when things go awry and we'll continue to do that every time I get an opportunity and um, I, that's really all we can do as both candidates and as elected officials is to shine the light and say that's not acceptable here we, um, this isn't anti-Muslim hate, but we did have a Zoom bomber, a um, couple of them actually, coordinated attack, um, as we have seen in, um, around the country of people targeting city councils with nonsense. And um, we had an inkling it was coming because in the city of Dublin, you have to register um, to make public comment via Zoom, and you have to do so with a valid email address. And so that we can send you the meeting link. So we had an idea that we were going to have a problem. And um, so I came prepared with a poster that said, no place for hate. So during the public comment, because we can't talk back, I held up that poster to let everybody know that this does not represent what Dublin is about. Um, so there are big things we can do and there are small things we can do. But there's, it's always on us to do something when we're encountering um, prejudice and hate. And um, I'll continue to do that. Thank Thanks you for, for that. Question. Uh, the short answer is yes. Uh, we have to stand up for 
any form of, uh, of, of hate as it relates to any culture. And I can say from the bottom of my heart that uh, whether it be Muslim or Asian, we, we get it, right? Um, I can't tell you how many times as a kid, you have people who say, hey, you know what? You, you have rice again today for lunch? Or, you know, it's like, hey, uh, uh, stand-eyed kid. It's like, what are you gonna do, fight back? So do you see my nose? It's actually a little bit crooked because I used to get in a lot of fights. So I'm the oldest of four boys. So I would defend my brothers. Um, that's why my nose is crooked. <laughs> so um, did it get physical? Yes, but you stand up for what's right. And what that means is even through the process of whether it be a policy or it be actions or you just standing up with everyone, as my two um, friends here have said, it's important. We all have to speak up. So from that perspective, the answer is always yes. We always stand up. Whether you're a citizen or, or council member, you have to get up and say something. So those are my words. Uh Thank you. Um, so as a currently elected council member in the city of Pleasanton, uh, I've already had a voting record and standing up against hate. I've also participated in anti-Asian -hate, uh, hate rallies, as well as when we put in a cricket field in our Ken Mercer Sports Park here in town, we had public comment that was very, very concerning to me because it had an overtone of, of uh, distrust and dislike and hate. And I was the only council member that stood up and said, that's not appropriate here in Pleasanton. Um, it is difficult to hear about how everyone is, uh, can relate to being targeted. It, it separates us. It makes us think we're alone and we're not. You know, there's that common adage that more combined, uh, more, there's more in common than apart. And uh, I think for us, um, you need your leaders to be showing that. And I can't change the fact that I'm obviously a Caucasian male, but hopefully my actions and my votes show that I'm always trying to see the life path that you have walked and make sure I can help support it. Because I think we all have tried to, uh, we, we all have similar values, which I think are uh, better lives for our children, better lives for ourselves, uh, peace so that we can all achieve our own best potential and we can set up our families to do the same. I know that a lot of commonality exists in that. So hate has no place. Hate has no um, area where it should hide. And we should be doing our best to try to make sure everyone does understand that they have a right to be here and they are welcomed here. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you all for sharing that. It's important that the community hears the unique ways in which you'll address and combat hate and how hate has impacted you in your personal lives as well. Thank you so much for that. So our next question in a similar vein is to do with the genocide in Gaza. So the U.S. sends billions of dollars in aid to the state of Israel to support the ongoing occupation of Palestinian territories, including Gaza and the West Bank. The last year has had a devastating death toll, with the majority being women and children. The Lancet, one of the world's most esteemed medical journals, published an article estimating that the death toll in Gaza is 186,000 people, which is 8% of the population. These are apocalyptic numbers. Many U.S. citizens have family in Gaza, and people in this very community have lost over dozens of their family members. In addition, the Washington Post and Associated Press reported on U.S. citizens and American doctors being trapped in Gaza. Despite this having direct local impact on residents, some local city officials have avoided getting involved, often citing this as an international issue. And with election season approaching, the community will be closely watching whether or not their elected officials demonstrate moral clarity in this crucial moment. So my question is this. Are you aware that many cities across California are investing in businesses that are actively enabling a genocide that is killing innocent people? And would you support redirecting the city's investment policy towards more ethical businesses that are not in the business of war? And can you commit to echoing your community and supporting a ceasefire resolution and stand against the killing and suffering of innocent civilians? Yeah, we're going to because I have the mic. Uh, so let me, let me start with... Um, it's very concerning to me, the international politics of the world right now, right? No one's winning. No, no child is getting a better future or a better life. And peace matters, right? So peace matters. Um, I do think we have to focus on our local politics and we have to stay with that. Uh, Pleasanton having a resolution or not, um, while it's symbolic, and I can understand that, we also need to be very aware that we need to also focus on the issues 
such as our own public safety. We have to deliver public safety to you here. And we have to make sure that we are, just like we talked about with the last question, stomping out hate here as well, right? Um, so it's a very um, challenging issue for a local community, in my opinion, uh, fraught with challenges. But doesn't mean peace shouldn't be our prevalent, our, our, our guiding light, I guess I'll say it like that. Um, to the other part about whether we should um, advance a resolution or not, you know, we're doing things outside of maybe what you see. For example, our investment policy in Pleasanton, I'm on our audit committee, I have exactly talked to them about this. What are we doing? And maybe it's not public and in the face and in the action of what you may see in a, in a public meeting, but we are taking steps to be aware of this and conscientious of this, right? And uh, it'd be great if we could do it everything. Uh, and so, you know, we learn and we try to adapt but I also am trying to also keep you safe here. So thank you. Thank you for that. There were a lot of questions in that one question. If you'd like me to repeat, I can. I, can. <laughs> I, I want to try to remember the, the first one, which is, um, am I aware of any particular industry that uh, uh, contributes to the genocide? Is that? Exactly, but if you'd like to answer that specific portion, uh, of course. So, <laughs> well, yes, I, I'd be happy to, because the answer is I am actually unaware. I, I don't know. Okay. Um, and um, my colleagues may know more, which is perfectly okay. Um, uh, but to that point, uh, what I wrote down uh, as, a, as a talking point is, uh, is that we need to have public safety through clarity. And what that means is, from the perspective of EGOC development, when we look at businesses that want to come into Dublin, we have to perform the right amount of due diligence to determine, are they in fact contributing to what's happening overseas? Right? So that, as somebody who's actually been in mergers and acquisitions for 17 years, is something I do, and I do really darn well, because when you're looking at transacting with multi-billion dollars, you have to understand the details and minutia of both companies. As part of economic development, we have to understand who's coming in here, and do we support that? So from my perspective, the answer is uh, no, I do not support companies that have contributions to what's happening overseas from a very personal perspective. Um, but also, as part of my policy, it's to ensure that any company that wants to do business in Dublin, we have to diligently understand where they're actually generating their revenue, so that we know, as part of that process, whether they actually are contributing to what's happening overseas. Thank you for that. Thank you. I suppose it's hard to know if you're supporting it if you don't know which companies they are. Um, uh, I am aware of some of the companies that are um, supporting the genocide, such as Caterpillar and others. And um, we have talked about it at our city council. I think you were actually in the room. Yes. Um, we have um, recently uh, approved an audit committee. We didn't have one before. I'm not really sure why we didn't have a, um, an, a committee of two council members to um, be our sort of financial advising um, committee of the city council. We did form that. Um, Part of the reason we formed that was specific to look, specifically to look at divestment. It's going to take a little bit of time, but um, in the meeting that we did talk about that, um, I brought up and got colleagues to nod their heads to give staff direction that there were things that they could do immediately without waiting for council to um, specifically recommend specific companies. Um, we don't have a divestment policy yet because our committee hasn't met yet, um, but I specifically called for them to look at the list of companies um, that are specifically contributing to Netanyahu's disastrous policies that are targeting innocent civilians and for us to please not invest our money in them. I am one of those council members who believes that um, this is an international issue that does not belong at the local level from a uh, resolution um, perspective. But that doesn't mean that we should be using city funds to invest in these companies because that is absolutely a local issue. And so um, I am looking forward to our next quarterly financial report um, to show that we are no longer investing in companies that are doing business with Netanyahu's government, that are specifically supplying his government with the tools to bulldoze apartment buildings, to bulldoze refugee camps, to destroy civilian lives. Um, so we are taking those steps in Dublin. I will continue to make sure that we are taking those steps in Dublin. Um, but I don't believe that a ceasefire resolution um, calling on international policy belongs at the local city council level because, not because it's not important, but because it 
mires a local government in details over which we have no control and unfortunately takes staff time and council time away from the things that we actually can control that directly influence things that we can better the lives of our residents about. And so while I certainly have strong opinions and there are other organizations that I'm involved in that can make our voices heard, I don't believe it belongs at the dais in city council. Thank you for that. That's, um, it's, it's, it's really hard to think about the, 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 the tragedies that's unfolding you know, during our time and underneath our right noses. In times of conflict, it's, uh, it's crucial to remember the shared humanity that we all have and every human life is valuable and unnecessary loss of life, whether it's Palestinian or Israeli, demands our deepest compassion and attention. Uh, on, the, on the Palestinian side, over 50,000 people have died, 10, over 10,000 children. I mean, I don't know what else to, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know how else to paint uh, a worse picture than that. Uh, and it's because of this prolonged conflict, innocent families have suffered unimaginable loss. Uh, the impact on Palestinian civilians, I know personal from personal level, uh, it's huge. And uh, it's, uh, it's something that uh, we as Americans uh, need to pay attention to. And I, I aspire to pay attention to, should I have the honor of earning uh, your votes for city council. Um, I hold a balanced viewpoint and a peaceful resolution. I will, uh, uh, on my personal stand, from a personal stand, my stance remains ones of hope and peace with respect to human dignity. And as a candidate, I'll continue to promote that kind of understanding and balanced perspectives and advocate for solutions that prioritize civilian safety on all sides. That's whether I'm in city council or in my personal life. Uh, and as my, you know, my city council member, as, as Jean has said, not sure how much we could do at city council on the city council level, but there are a few things that I want to pay attention to that I'll detail here. Um, advocating for peace, advocating for ethical investments, and uh, advocating for conflict resolution. So I'm committed to policies that protect the sanctity of human life, both, both within our city and beyond. This includes advocating for wise ethical investments, ensuring our resources support companies that promote peace, community well-being, and uh, positive development, and avoiding those that are heavily involved in the military industrial complex across the board. It's, it's not just about Israel and Palestine. It's, it's across the board. We have genocides happening in Sudan. We have genocides happening all over the world. I don't want our money and I don't want our city funds be, to be mired in those kinds of conflicts. Um, and then being able to support humanitarian assistance on, on, in the best way we possibly can is going to be key to also helping those uh, civilians that are mired there. So supporting organizations that will send food and basic necessities of human life. Um, so I, I, I'm super, I'm, I, I was in that council meeting, uh, you know, when, when uh, Dublin established the, uh, the committee for finance. And I'm, I'm really excited about that. I think we're headed in the right direction. Um, and as a policy, I think it's great for us to look at how our money is invested. And I'll be advocating for ethical investments of how our money is, how, how our money is spent. Um, and of course, as, as council member uh, Jack also said, we have to also keep on, you know, on, on, on the local level, focusing on making sure we support our community with adequate resources provided to our peace officers to make sure they keep us all safe. It doesn't matter whether you're Muslim, Jew, or Arab, or whoever you are, that we need to make sure we eliminate, stamp out hate everywhere we go. So supporting our peace officers and making sure we educate them properly and, and uh, keeping them aware of the issues that are at hand is gonna be also key. Um, as far as the ceasefire is concerned, I, you know, I, I share my colleagues, uh, idea, but I'm not sure how effective it's going to be at the city level. But I can promise you this, as a city council member, my voice will be louder for a ceasefire at the federal level. I've got Eric Swalwell on speed dial for that. So, so I'll, 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 I'll keep pushing for that and I'll do the best that I can to, uh, to push this up the totem pole to the federal level and even the state level if I can uh, to advocate for a ceasefire uh, in, in Gaza, an immediate ceasefire. Thank you. Thank you for that. It's exciting to hear that Dublin is gaining momentum on an ethical investment policy. I was at that meeting, so um, thank you for sharing some more details of that to the community as well. So what we'll do now is open up, uh, open it up to the audience for any questions, just for like five minutes. Um, sure, you, if you want to start, you can go ahead. Just, oh yeah, here we go. Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, my name is Morshan. Uh, when you was 10 years old, actually, I first read about the Anne Frank history, uh, life. Anne Frank, she was a Jewish girl. The Nazi killed her in the Holocaust. So I was thinking that time that how the whole world let it happen that time. 
I did not realize until the Gaza happened, the whole war let, let it happen. And uh, I, I saw a lot of uh, local city council and around the Bay Area, and even normally because I follow them, they say it is, we should not interfere our local politics, international one. But I totally disagree. The reason I disagree, you like it or not, the U.S. is the most powerful country in the world. They have 72 military base in the world, and they interfere, our, we, our country interfere, everyone in the world, because we need to maintain the, uh, our most powerful country in the world, most pow our powerfulness. In last year, until now, is, oh, America gave Israel $18 billion, and uh, it is our taxpayer money. And we want to know that how it goes. You like it or not, it is our money. And for American, for us, we work, most of us pay to pay paycheck for our rent, for our uh, loan, for the home, for our tuition fee, for medical. And Israel, they have the free health care. They have everything free. Why we need to pay, why they don't need to pay. They are using our money. They use it for the health care. They are using that for the military. They are using for their all the things and why our local official are so hesitate to recognize that. This is a powerful country, we are not, if you're somebody like, even if I, I actually grew up in Japan, so last month, or no, no, in August, in Japan, we had the atomic bomb, and we put, uh, the America put, at, I think, the, the fall, I think they attack atomic bomb in Japan on August, and the mayor of Nagasaki asked Israeli ambassador not to uh, visit uh, Nagasaki. So if in Japan, they are not a powerful country, they can make this a strength, a regional country, mayor in Nagasaki. Why the most powerful countries in the world, in the US, you have hesitated to do that thing. I just want to, I want to know that thing. Because it is our taxpayer money. We are giving $18 billion per year, only this year. Why our local politician is not responsible for that one? Uh, thank you. you. You raised some really good points. Um, and if a member of the Israeli government wanted to come to Dublin, I would have a different answer than I have now about a, a ceasefire resolution, because then it would be a local issue. Then it would absolutely be an issue that impacts what we do from the Dublin City Council. I do believe that citizens of Dublin should be making their voices heard to their congressional representatives, to their senators. I do believe that every citizen of Dublin should be making their voices heard to the people that are making the decisions about who we are funding as a federal government and also on the state level where our representatives visit. Sometimes they go to Israel, sometimes they go to other places, and I think that you should absolutely, as a citizen of this country, make your voice heard to your state representatives, to your local representatives, to your national representatives about the things that they can control. But at the city council level, we have zero control over where your federal tax dollars are spent and where your state tax dollars are spent. But we do have control about things like what type of building happens in our cities and the roads, our traffic, and your school boards have control over what policies are being taught in your school. And those kinds of things are also important to your day-to-day -day lives. And when we have council meetings where we talk about international or national issues, you get a wide variety of people that come out and have a wide variety of opinions. And those debates tend to bog down the council meetings and grind us to a halt about things we have no control about. So I'm not, I, I don't want anybody to misconstrue my position as thinking that this is somehow unimportant or that the U.S. should be doing what we're doing instead of doing something different. But from an official council policy, I don't believe it belongs there. That doesn't mean that I haven't expressed my own opinion to my federal representatives as a US citizen. It doesn't mean that I haven't advocated in other ways, but at the dais, that's at the local level, we have no control over it. But I strongly urge everybody to contact their representatives that can make those decisions. Contact your congressman, contact your senator, and have everybody you know do the same, because that's where you'll move the needle. But advocating to local governments that have no decision-making power, we don't send money as a city to the federal government. We don't 
send that money. We don't send the money that you pay in taxes to the state government. And we don't interface in any way with members of the, um, the international community, except on things like Diwali festivals, when we once in a while talk to the uh, consul generals. And we can certainly have informal conversations there, and we do. When we um, have sister city trips, um, Dublin has a sister city in uh, Bray, Ireland, and when we have um, back and forth with them, we talk about international politics all the time on a more informal level. Um, those are conversations that we have a lot, but to, to be discussing national and international politics officially from the dais simply stops us from doing the business of the city, and, and that's going to remain my position, unfortunately. That that that's a very close one to my heart. Uh, four years ago, 2020, when COVID hit, I, and I'll I'll answer your question. When when COVID hit, I I was I was shocked at the policies that were coming down from our state government and from our federal government. We didn't know, uh, you know, we didn't know what was happening. I I, I own gyms in the Bay Area. That's what I do. Um, so we didn't know. We wanted a seat at the table as gym owners to figure out who was making these policies, who was telling people like when to put a mask on, when to take a mask off. Uh, how were these, you know, how were these, how are these filtering down to business owners without having the business owner having a seat at the table, right? So I remember I called my dad, who was, uh, you know, he's been my rock for many years. So I called him and I'm like, hey, dad, you know, I, I don't know what to do. I was about to give up. I have no idea. I mean, people were, I was just being handed edicts down my way, saying, shut your door, shut your door, without a solution at the time and of course you know solutions came later on but uh, my dad told me you know I mean one thing you can do is get involved you know get involved in city politics find out who's in charge find out who's making these rules for you on your behalf so that that that's the moment at which it started my journey into you know into city politics and to into politics in general uh, I looked at it and I said who was the person that was in charge of making these decisions on my behalf is it the governor, is it the state, is it the local health officer at the time that was empowered by a state of emergency in, 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 you know, in, in, uh, in Sacramento to push these rules down. And what I found was a lot of people, business owners similar to myself, didn't understand you know, what was happening and didn't understand how to confront the problem. So similarly, when it comes to these issues like this, and I, I circle back to what we talked about at the first is how do we combat hate? And the simplest thing you can do is get involved. You know, get involved in our city politics. Get involved in, 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 in making decisions. When council has meetings, attend. I know we saw care there. When council, when you know, when our when our state legislatures hold town halls here uh, to talk with them about these kinds of things, attend and pay attention. Make public comments. Those are the kind of things that you know people pay attention to, and our city council pays attention to. I ran in 2022, and I lost that race. But that got me involved in the Dublin Chamber of Commerce. That allowed me to get in and understand, you know, meet all of our, I'm going to say this because I, I think all of our city council members are amazing people. They, they, they sacrifice their, you know, a lot of their time to, to, for the betterment of the community for really very little pay, <laughs> you know. So it's, it's and there's no, there, there's no hidden, I mean, they, they do a great job and they do it because they love Dublin and they love, they love the city that, you know, that, that we all grew up in and that's, that's what we do. So, uh, you know, I, I, you, you get involved, you lose, but it's okay. We, we, you know, we get involved in the Dublin Chamber of Commerce. I learned the ropes. I understood who, you know, who was in charge. I understood who was making these policies. Uh, that journey took me all the way to Sacramento during which I shook hands with Governor, with uh, Governor Newsom actually uh, to, uh, when, when they allowed gyms to reopen. I was part of a coalition that, that worked to mitigate, you know, solutions for gyms to reopen safely. And I was very proud of that moment to be able to sit there next to him and shake hands. But the simple, simple answer to that, brother, get involved. That's, that's the simple answer. I mean, it's not get involved, show up to the meetings, uh, you know, whenever issues come up on, on the agenda, make, make public comments, not just at the city level, but more importantly at, you know, town halls and, uh, and you know, Eric Swalwell is from Dublin too. He's here. He's right here. <laughs> so I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the federal decisions that are being made, your representative is here. So it's 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 good to attend and be involved and, and uh, understand. And you'll I think you'll find that you'll you'll have you'll have. Uh, I, I love this country because your your voice matters. You just have to be involved. I, I love it. I love it. And I have to be better. Uh, however, I I think I think it just I, you know for me personally I asked a hundred times before I got one answer. Okay, just in the best interest of time, we'll take one more question before we let them make their closing statements. Go ahead. Yeah. 
Yes, sir. I'm, uh, my name is Asif. I'm a resident of the city of Pleasanton. Thank you for coming. Yeah, so I know we have been talking about uh, many international issues, but if I can, if you don't mind, if I can bring the conversation back to our local issues. So my question to you guys, I know we have limited time, is what are the challenges that city of Dublin, city of Pleasanton faces and what uh, what is your vision? What 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 are your priorities for helping people who live in this area? Thank you. Yeah, excellent question. So uh, my name again is Jack Balch, and I'm representing Pleasanton or running for Pleasanton mayor. So just as a reference compared to my Dublin colleagues here, I think Pleasanton's challenges are definitely fiscal challenges. People and uh, residents and businesses probably understand that Pleasanton is facing some fiscal challenges with uh, misdirected spending on our priorities. Uh, so for my for my uh, closing statement, I'll be discussing that. But when you, when you don't have a your fiscal house in order, it's not a partisan issue. When when you you know it doesn't matter if you're Democrat or Republican, you you have to balance your checkbook. And by having a balanced checkbook, a robust savings account, or a robust revenues, we're able to afford the nice things that we would like in our city. Public safety being number one. Our our police response times are increasing in Pleasanton, and that scares me. That's, we're at five minutes and 19 seconds. When you call 911 in Pleasanton, that's our average response time for an officer to show up. And it used to be around the four minutes. So that extra minute and 19 seconds uh, when your family might be at risk is important to me. Uh, economic vitality for me is probably the next element. <clears throat> I believe Pleasanton's downtown used to be a jewel of the Tri-Valley, and I believe that we're now seeing that we've lost a lot of that shine as we look to Livermore or Dublin now looking at a downtown or Danville. They've invested in, in trying to attract and retain businesses, while our mall is, in my opinion, unfortunately dwindling in its, in its former glory. So uh, we have built the rules which either entice and encourage business or turn them away in Pleasanton. And unfortunately, I think we've got to be a little less pretentious on what we allow and be open to new and exciting things. A lot of our original policies were based upon selling a widget, selling a product. But I think in today's world with Amazon, where we could all be delivered almost anything under the sun within 24 hours, uh, people go and visit our downtown or our businesses for entertainment, for restaurants, for experience. And I think we need to be encouraging that. And then uh, we've already kind of talked about public safety, fiscal responsibility, uh, uh, economic vitality, and then my last is our education system. Uh, our city partners with our school districts in Pleasanton to program the gyms, to provide the school fields or program the school fields. And that is what helps all of our children. I come back to our commonality for me, which is uh, just like my family, I believe every family here is trying to build a better life for their children and for themselves, to advance them, to have it where the next generation is better, uh, better off, better s situated, stronger. Um, affordable housing factors into that. So those are the directions I think Pleasanton needs to be focused on going to, to really advance and uh, propel us to the future, to, to really grasp uh, change to make our lives better. So thank you. Ashif, yes? Asif, uh, thank you for your question. Um, I actually wrote down a few notes, if I may. Uh, read off of that, is that okay? I'll try to keep it about two and a half minutes. All right, so um, today we were asked, uh, I was asked to come here to talk about vision and uh, action. Uh, and I love the question because it's very direct and there's not a lot of time we can provide in terms of fluff. So if I may, I'll talk about the three key things that I think are critically important from the Dublin perspective on how we can serve you. So um, here are the policies that I'd like to work on with respect to, to each one of you. So the first one is uh, what I call public respect through cultural sensitivity. Uh, that is from the perspective of our Dublin police services, I think we do a wonderful job of giving them a lot of diversity training. Uh, but can we go a little bit further? So one of the ideas that I have is, um, can we give them, let's say, multilingual uh, training? So from 2010 to 2020, we grew by 58%. Um, we weren't actually the fastest growing city in the Bay Area. We were the fastest growing city in all of California. So where do all those people come from? Um, well, it wasn't from Dublin, Ohio, and it's not from Dallas, Texas. It's from cities like Taiwan, Tehran, Bangalore, Jakarta, right? So English is not the primary language. So how do we interact with our DPS, the Dublin Police Services, if they can't interact with us with some level of respect and courtesy as well? So can we teach them 
very simple terms like ni hao, salam alaikum, namaste. Right? Those are things that we would love to have just as a very first interaction. Number two, uh, what I call public enrichment through greater clarity. Um, we absolutely need to cl uh, clean up how information is shared and given to you. So what I mean by that is today, uh, what I'd like to offer is how do we get all of the resolutions, all of the minutes, all of the agendas that come through city council translated in a way that is consumable and understandable by you for those of us who don't have English as our primary language. So can we convert those meeting minutes into Cantonese, Mandarin, Telugu, Hindi, Arabic? Right? Very simple, very low cost, but look at the intended consequence of the benefit to us as a public. Uh, so the third one is what I call public confidence through transparency. Uh, we need and we demand more openness. And what I want to say about that is, I think from the perspective of one of the measures that we have on the ballot today, which is JJ, um, I feel that we have some benefits of a great start with regard to transparency. Uh, whether it goes one way or the other, uh, what I'd like to do is promise you that I'd like to take it further, which is we need to add more to it because I think it puts the burden of transparency on the city council or city staff, but what about city council members? So what I'd like to offer is that how do we add version two of that so we make it more transparent, such as how do we open up all of our council member calendars so you know who we're meeting with and who we're having conversations with, right? That's number one. Number two, how do we disclose our financial interests in companies that are in our city? So for example, in my district is a company called Snowflake, big tech company. Should, I, should you know if I'm, a stake, if I'm a stockholder in a company so you can analyze whether or not my decisions are being influenced by my personal uh, gain? Uh, and then third, uh, can we have uh, travel? For, uh, for any council member who's traveling officially, can you see where we're going, why we're going, and our expenses, right? Open transparency. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, I know that sounds really all very boring, <laughs> but good government actually is boring. Why? Because when we're doing what we're supposed to do, we're serving you. Thanks. Those are great ideas, and we're doing almost all of them already. Um, regarding the, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to take just a minute to address what he, what he said, because um, uh, regarding the investments in companies that are in business, um, every council member in the entire state must fill out a f uh, conflict of interest form called the Form 700 every year um, that discloses if you own stock in a company that does business in your jurisdiction. Also, if you have a salary from a company in your jurisdiction, um, the travel is all public record um, and is disclosed on the um, the uh, quarterly, actually the monthly um, warrant register that is on the agenda packets every month and also um, is on, you know, our, our, it's just a freedom of information request and so is our calendars. So um, the vast majority of that is already, is already public record. Um, as far as the issues that I see in Dublin, um, obviously public safety is a big topic of conversation in the entire state right now. The Bay Area is no exception. We um, want to make sure that our police officers and our firefighters, because that's the, the piece people forget when they talk public safety, making sure that our residents are safe. Um, I do sit on the Public Safety Policy Committee for the California League of Cities and also the National League of Cities Public Safety and Prime Crime Prevention Policy Committee, where um, I can both advocate for better policy within the state of California and for better legislation, but also at the federal level advocate for um, federal funding to cities and towns for um, police grants and for better technology and to learn about the best practices within policing, community policing in the um, country. We just updated our um, cameras, our license plate reader cameras and our, our um, situational awareness cameras so that they are operating in real time and we know who's coming into our city and stolen cars and can track them and things like that. Um, and also advocating for the privacy of that data so that for example, an officer that might be interested in where his ex-wife is going doesn't have access to that data without a um, case number, things like that. Um, so making sure that we are ensuring the safety of our residents by increasing officers as our population increases, as our calls for service increase, tracking all that data in real time. So public safety is always number one. It doesn't matter when someone's running, what the national conversation is, what the local conversation is. If our residents aren't safe, if they don't feel safe, then they really don't talk about anything else. Um, 
the other issues that we really are focusing on is um, economic development and sustainability over time. We are in the situation where Dublin was the fastest growing city in the state, um, actually 12th fastest growing in the country <laughs> between the 2010 and 2020 census. And all of that growth brought um, some challenges to the city of Dublin, but also some real opportunities in um, terms of development fees and um, uh, our property taxes are a little higher than our neighboring cities because all of our residents are new and we haven't had time for the Prop 13 to um, artificially lower the um, the assessed valuation like some of our neighboring cities. And so San Ramon and Pleasanton are both um, in the situation where they are asking their residents to approve um, a sales tax. Um, we want to make sure that we don't get to that point. We know that over time it is, you know, as cities mature, they're revenues drop and their expenses increase. We've built beautiful, beautiful parks and facilities in Dublin, and we want to make sure that we're able to maintain those over time. Just like when you buy a brand new home and your washing machine and your dryer and your dishwasher and your refrigerator are all brand new at the same time, and then 15 years down the line, if you're lucky, they all start to fail at the same time, and you need to replace them at once. We've built all of our beautiful facilities and parks within sort of the same two decades, we want to make sure that we are sweeping our surpluses into reserves specifically for the purpose of replacing turf, updating um, playground bathrooms, updating um, our roads when they start to wear out so that we maintain the quality of life for our residents down the road. Because we have relatively short term limits in Dublin, measured JJ notwithstanding, whether they get extended or not, um, my focus is on setting up the city um, for the future. We. We, I don't want to hand off a turkey to the next council and the next council and the next council, making sure that the decisions that we make now will sustain us long term. And so um, we need in Dublin more area for um, commercial businesses. We have um, very small areas for um, office park and for light industrial businesses compared to our neighboring cities we really have a very small footprint for, for that type of commercial development. So we are um, working really hard on an area called the uh, Fallon East Economic Development Zone, where we will be able to attract high-tech jobs to Dublin, um, green tech, biotech, uh, light manufacturing, advanced research, um, so that over time we will be able to expand our sales tax base and our property tax base beyond auto dealers. Um, we are very dependent on car sales in Dublin. And when the um, economy tanks and people put off buying new cars, we have a outsized hit to our sales tax revenue. Um, and as Dublin reaches build out, and I know that some people go, is Dublin ever going to reach build out? We actually are approaching build out. And so we um, are transitioning from being a, a developer built city to being a maintenance city. So we really need to diversify our um, revenue streams. And so we're, we're, everything that I do is looking towards the future of Dublin. Um, Dublin's my home. I'm going to retire here. I want it to be beautiful and prosperous and thriving for years to come. And so safety and economic development and um, environmental sustainability, making sure that we are increasing walking trails and increasing pedestrian um, infrastructure and adding a thriving downtown to our um, to our city. We don't have a downtown. We've been clamoring for a downtown and making sure that we are um, stratifying our housing market so that we aren't just all single family homes and large town homes that we have. Um, we have a place for our seniors who want to downsize because Dublin has built a lot of two and three story homes and not a lot of single story homes that our young professionals and our teachers and our firefighters and our retail managers have a place that they can buy into in Dublin so that we build some small for sale units, not just the high density apartments near the BART stations that the state is um, insisting that we do. And so that, that's kind of what um, I see the, the issues in Dublin are right now. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I, this is the first year that Dublin's going to district-wide elections, and it's an exciting time. So this is District 3, and you have both candidates for District 3 here tonight. Uh, I think the question of transparency and, and the government sustainability, making sure that we're transparent in our communication, district-based elections, I think, will help that. And as, as I canvass and talk to our neighbors, my goal once I get into office, 
should I have the on and privilege of being elected to office is to uh, hold monthly town halls via Zoom and or via uh, about any issues that come up that that our uh, that our residents in our district or across all of Dublin could be involved in and ask questions openly. This is beyond obviously my attendance to uh, in in city hall meetings. Um, th particularly District Three within Dublin spans Hacienda to Fallon, with the backside being Gleason, and there's Jordan Ranch part uh, parts of Jordan Ranch on the other side. Um, in our district, I, I, I'm taking a lot of lessons from Pleasanton, and I was, um, you know, we, we, you know, I'm, I'm a business owner. I've been a business owner for over 15 years. I look at long-term projections and I look at budgets. So one of the things I've studied really hard over the last, uh, you know, three months, uh, and as I attended these city council meetings, is our is our city budget. And I look at our budget, and I'm excited because we've done an amazing job, and we we, we have reserves. We, I mean, it's like when you compare us to Pleasanton and San Ramon, it's like unbelievable when you look at it, you know, uh, spreadsheet to spreadsheet. Uh, we have reserves. We've done an amazing. We have we have we have an amazing job. Uh, we've done an amazing job at, at building up reserves and having enough uh, having our you know our bank account taken care of the right way. But I also look at our future. I also look at our. I project five years from now, six years from now. And if you look at our budget closely, five years from now, six years from now, we start trending. And I, I'm sorry to use Pleasanton as an example, but they're our big brother and big sister, and I learn from them. So we start trending in the direction where revenues start going coming down and expenses start going up. Right. So as a business owner, I look at that and I say, what, a, what, what can I do to get our city prepared for the future? What can I, what can I do to mitigate that so that, and I, I, unfortunately, I don't, you know, I love Pleasanton. It's a beautiful city. I don't want to end up like Pleasanton, you know, having to raise taxes or having to raise, uh, you know, talking about measure PP or any kind of raise tax. And Jack, this is not, you know, I love Pleasanton. It's an amazing city. Uh, but I, I want to learn from that. I want to take a look at that and see. And the, the best way I can look at that is what, a little bit of what Gene talked about is economic development. We've got an area within District 3 called Hacienda Crossings. It used to be the jewel of East Dublin. It's one of the best places. And you used to come. You'd have Starbucks, hang out, go watch a movie, chill, you know, local, check out all the re local retailers there. And it's dwindled. And my fear as I, I live right across the street from Hacienda Crossings. So my fear is that I don't want Hacienda Crossings to become the Stone Ridge Mall. So I look at that area and I see what can we do to incentivize growth and make sure that we invite, uh, man, he's going to get me afterwards, I know, <laughs> I know. Uh, how, what can we do to incentivize growth in that area? What, how, how can we be creative about attracting the right kind of retailers, a new version, a new edition of retailers that's going to sustain growth within that city? Do we look at places like, you know, can we look at Walnut Creek? Can we look at what, you know, Dandel's done? Can we look at what, you know, San Ramon's done a great job of, you know, with Bishop Ranch and everything else? How can we revise that area to become, you know, to, to retain its, its, its glamour so that as we look five years from now when our Revenues start, you know, coming down. We're increasing our sales tax revenue. We don't have to depend on car sales, right? So we can look at, you know, we can keep our sales tax dollars within our city. I want my daughter to come hang out here, and not go, you know, to uh, San Ramon and or and, and the lot or whatever, right? So I want her to enjoy uh, having fun in Dublin. The next thing is, you know, we've experienced a lot of growth, and it's an amazing. We have, I, I believe, uh, you know, fact checkers, beware. I'm sorry, but our, the first high school in 30 years in the Bay Area, I think, in Emerald. Uh, okay, yeah, Emerald High School. So, well, it's the first, second high school in. Dublin. So it's, it's an amazing thing to have a second high school in Dublin. With that comes a lot of growth challenges for our residents around that area. So I want to study traffic patterns. I want to make sure that we, you know, do we need, I mean, I, I, you know, what are, what are some of the solutions that we can offer our residents in and around Emerald High School within District 3 that can mitigate their, uh, and, and help them with their commute in and out of the area? And the third and final thing within District 3, and I'll talk about Dublin and, uh, afterwards, is, is a, a development in East Dublin, so, which is exclusive, you know, inclusive or exclusive of Dublin Boulevard going all the way through. We have the Fallon East Economic Development Zone, which is crucial to us being able to attract some higher paying jobs to Dublin. Dublin, we've done a great job, but you know, our highest percentage of jobs is we've got 22,000 jobs there, or and or sorry, we twenty two percent of those jo of the highest of, of the jobs that we have are retail. We need higher paying jobs in Dublin. Uh, we need we need people. We, we want our residents to live, work, raise families, and play in Dublin. We don't want them traveling, you know, to uh, uh, to the Bay Area, to San Jose, or whatever. So it makes for a better quality of life if we're able to attract higher paying jobs. And I've got some ideas on how to do that. I've got you know I've, I've chaired the Chamber of Commerce for last year, and I've been in the Chamber of Commerce for the last four years. I've worked closely with our city's economic development department. I have, you know, there's maybe perhaps we should look at sending our economic development team to symposiums around town to talk about whenever these, you know, groups get together to talk about biotech and, and green tech and how we can get put together a package that makes sense for them to be invited to our city. And I know we have something like that right now for the Fallon East Economic Development Zone. I want to implement something similar for Hacienda Crossings, see how we can assist the, that business owner 
owner, I mean that landowner and, and that commercial building owner to make sure we save it. And then the final thing is, you know, uh, uh, Jackie talked about Pleasanton being the jewel of the Tri Valley. I'm sorry, man. Dublin's going to be the jewel of the Tri Valley. <laughs> so we've got we've got you know we've got an amazing opportunity to bring in some new, fresh thinking into how we shape our downtown Dublin. Uh, and I, I know we've worked long and hard uh, to lay out our street grids, making sure that we have the right kind of messaging out there, the right kind of areas. Um, and I looked at the, some of the plans, and I was very pleased. One of the council meetings that I attended, I saw some you know I saw you know a glimpse of it. You know, personally. On a personal level, I don't think we need eight stories. There's things that we could do to mitigate difference, but I'm also a business owner, so I, I know what it's like to, I sign leases, I negotiate leases. This is what I do for a living. This is what I've done for the last 10 years. One of the things I look at when, I, you know, when, I, when, when I'm executing a lease is uh, how much parking do I have, right? So I wanna make sure we support the parking structures. We make sure those businesses that we support downtown Dublin uh, or in the future of downtown Dublin are gonna have enough parking and uh, being able to sustain you know, the growth that we have. So I'm, I'm so excited for the, uh, for the the, uh, for the vision that Dublin has for the future. I think we have an opportunity to shape and I think we have an opportunity to learn from our bigger brothers and sisters that are neighboring us and see those, you know, and, and, and being able to work with them on, on, on things that make, you know, that, that will make not just Dublin, but, you know, the, the whole Tri-Valley a better place to live. And that's, uh, and, and that's why I'm running. So thank you guys. Thank you, everybody. So normally I'd offer you the chance to have closing statements when we need to get to the other candidates, but I'm really glad that we ended on a local note. Thank you for that question. It was good to hear from all of you of what you want to do on a local level. Thank you so much. So I'd like for our San Ramon candidates to come up. And also, we had one more Pleasanton candidate back there, Vivek, who wasn't able to speak. So you can come up with San Ramon candidates.